So the good thing is I'm just here to tell you uh, my thought process and what I do in my operation. I'm not here as an educator. I'm not trying to convince you to do anything. Um, you can just listen, and if you uh, think some of these ideas are the same as yours, the same as Josh's, that's great. If you don't, that's fine. Don't even tell me about it. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, I want to thank my student farm managers. I'm a, a full-time veterinarian. I, I do 100% beef practice. So I rely heavily on my uh, student farm managers through the summer. Uh, that's one of my earlier farm managers. That's Dr. Dan Schock. He now works for Zoetis Animal Health in Canada. That's Dr. Jennifer Spurl. She's a, a veterinarian who works in this area. Uh, that's uh, um, one of my associates. And she's been working with me since she started in high school. Um, and that's taken a couple of years ago. Just a quick overview of my operation. Uh, it changes every year. I have a different mix of crops and, and grazing. Uh, in 2014, I have about 850 acres. Uh, 700 acres was in grazing and hay. 575 acres in soybeans. Uh, 175 acres of oats. And about 400 acres of uh, river, woodland, and wetland. Uh, in that year, I grazed about 340 yearlings and had 69 cow-calf pairs. <coughs> My grazing management uh, principles are I use sheltered gladed holding paddocks in the spring to get started earlier. Uh, I, I try to rotate every two to three days, basically, and aim for a 40-day rest period. And of course, that depends on uh, the grazing season and a, and a bunch of other factors. And I also want to extend the grazing season as long as I can in the fall. So I'm not sure how these pictures turn out, but that's uh, uh, you know some uh, sales barn calves going out to grass <clears throat> probably uh, early April. Uh, there's, there's another group of cattle in some gladded areas, uh, and that you can see there's some grats, there's some uh, buds showing up there, so that's probably late April. Uh, here Here's some cattle uh, uh, partway through the grazing season. That's a slightly bigger paddock than I normally have, and that the purpose of that is just to show the, um, uh, the mineral blocks, the salt, the salt uh, uh, trace mineralized salt uh, feeding system. Again, this is through the summer. Uh, I use uh, my fencing system. I use I uh, rely heavily on uh, uh, just using spools. So I have a, a perimeter fence. I have a couple of semi-permanent uh, single strand uh, cross fences, electric cross fences, and then the rest is all spools. Another, another shot, again, of the summer, just showing, working through some of the different farms. Uh, this is a picture taken in 2012, that really bad drought year that we had. And here I had some, uh, uh, some, uh, <coughs> some yearlings, and you can see this is a very small paddock. Uh, the paddock itself is probably 20 acres. There's about 230 yearlings in this, in this picture, and I was probably grazing about two or three acres and moving them every day. And by the way, that was, that was, for whatever reason, I'm still not sure exactly why, and I wish I, I, I I'm, I'm aiming for that. That's my sort of my high water mark. That year where we had such a terrible drought, that was my best year ever as far as gains. I gained, I averaged 2.4 2 pounds a day gain on about 180 days, of, no, 200 days of pasture. I, get, I got about 450 pounds a gain on that dry year. And I haven't been able to replicate it since. There's something that I... Uh, that I'm missing that I'm trying to, to find out. I'll talk about that later on. Okay, so that's midsummer. Um, as we get into the, into, the, into the fall to try to extend the grazing season, I'll put uh, bales of hay out to grass. And on this farm here, you can see there, 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 there's hay right there, and it's just average quality hay. Just, and so I just put it on the ground, let them eat what they want. And I don't know if you can see in this picture, but there's bales of hay scattered all through this to this, uh, this grazing cell. And then as I move the cattle through the grazing cells, they get, they get the grass, and they also get the hay, and I can slow my rotation down, and so I can keep these cattle out there a bit longer. And so this is getting on into the fall, and these cattle are getting a little bit shinier. Um, <clears throat> there I am moving some cattle um, through a soybean field that was harvested. I had to wait until the soybeans came off, and I was gonna move these cattle to, their, to the last uh, pasture. And there they are in the last pasture. 
So watering systems. I use three types of watering systems. I have an elevated uh, a windmill that pumps water from a holding uh, pond up to a higher area. I use uh, drilled wells and pressurized water lines, the traditional system, and I use point source uh, water at river crossings. So this is one of my operations, and I've got a, about a one acre uh, pond there. It's about uh, 18 feet deep, and so that um, large windmill is the one that pumps water to a high spot. The smaller windmill is an aeration, aeration windmill. Uh, that's the, uh, the holding tank higher up on the hill. That's a picture of the holding tank from the other direction. You can see the, uh, the pond down below and, and the windmill. And then by uh, uh, above ground water lines, I uh, move the water down to the different paddocks. Uh, water is, is critical, um, especially in July and August. I always try to have a second or even a third source of water in case there's any problems. And as you can see here, I've got uh, uh, two water tanks set up. Uh, I'll use one water tank in the spring. That's all you need on these, on these larger groups. But, you know, when you get 200 head of cattle, even in small paddocks, uh, I like to have lots of water for them. So I'll, I'll run two water tanks. That's another, another farm. And uh, this is on a pr pressurized system. So I can use a smaller tank and, uh, and just move them around. So I, I used to have central water places. But now I find it a lot easier just, just to move the, the tanks uh, through the fields. And that's the third type of watering system where basically that's a Saugeen River in the front and that's a, a crossing that I cross, uh, cross the river to other paddocks. So the cattle can just go over there and, they, and then they just, uh, they just get water from that section right now, right in front there. Fencing systems, I won't say very much, uh, but for the um, semi-permanent cross fences, I like just using, uh, this is called a G-spring. And it's handy. It's a tightener and also a, a holder at the end. So I don't need any gates. Uh, basically, I just tick, tick, pull that out, lower the fence down, and push it off to one side to move cattle between paddocks uh, in, the, in, the, in the fall. To, to reduce, reduce pressure on, on snow load, I'll just pull that, uh, that G-spring off and drop the fence down. Very simple and easy. What it means is you need a very simple post. That, that post, uh, you know, if that was left on in the wintertime, it would be too much too much uh, pressure on the, on the fence for snow load. The fence wouldn't break, but the post would sag. This way I can just drop it down and you put a small post in and it lasts virtually forever. So that basically is, uh, you know, for, this is for a small group. Obviously it's a small water tank, but uh, I have the mineral feeder, the water tank, I, and this, that's also a, a mineral feeder that I'll use in the summertime when there's not much rain. I just put both things on top, hook on the back with an ATV, and move the whole thing to the next paddock. This is a picture in the, in the summertime. And just, the only reason I showed this is just to give you an idea of, you know, I've got one central post, and you can almost see where I've um, divided this field into, into sections. And of course, I'll strip graze the rest. And that's, that's too big of a paddock right there to, to, uh, for the cattle to have um, at one time. So I'll just have divide this field up and then just, just strip graze with, with my spools through there. Yes, Steve? Yeah, well, that hot wire right there is so they wouldn't play with the float. And uh, so, you know, that we've talked about electricity and, and water. Like, water is so critical that you have to really be careful. Um, <clears throat> I have very few health issues with my cattle, but if I do have health issues, water is often the source of them, water and poor management on my part. But yes, yeah, Steve, that, that one, that's there on purpose because that, that float that's right there, they're playing with it and they're you know, basically knocking over and, and so on. So environmental management, so that's my system basically. So environmental management, um, uh, I fence off all the woodlots. I have about 30 acres of glade grazing that I use for basically uh, in the spring and the fall. Um, I've, I've uh, fenced off all the rivers and permanent streams. Uh, it sounds a little bit of a contradiction between Josh and I, but i show you some pictures. I think you'll see we have a different environment. Same principle, just different environment. And uh, the intermittent streams are 
or the riparian area around the intermittent streams are rotationally grazed. So this just shows the, the fence uh, to keep the cattle out of, out, of the, um, out of the forest. There's some glade grazing sections. There's some more glade grazing. Uh, it's actually, you can get really good grazing through there, and it's really good in the, in the spring for starting cattle. The Sogging River, I've got about two miles of Sogging River, and I fenced most of it off. Um, except for uh, river crossings and point sources of water and, and floodplain areas. So here's a section of the Sogging River that I've just, what I do is I'll just drop electric fence down, take those posts off, leave it down, wait till the flood floods over, and then just put the fence back up again. There's a picture of that section right there. So the, uh, you know, this is about a three acre um, um, floodplain. So I, I, I will graze cattle there in the spring, and uh, uh, and they won't they won't affect the uh, stream bank at all. There's another uh, picture of another another part of the Sogging River. Again, I've just um, fenced, fenced this off. Again, this is a temporary fence because this is a floodplain through here. Um, um, the reason I think I have to fence off the Sogging River is because we work on a smaller land base. So these, these farms here, um, I think there'd be too much damage to the, soil, to the bank if I tried to, re to do repair and grazing on all, on all of them. I don't seem to be able to manage this. OK. Um, Another, again, it's not a picture. Uh, again, you can see there's a riparian area in front here. And so I'll graze around here, and then I'll put a, a light graze through here to try to sort of maintain the, uh, maintain the riverbank. Intermittent streams, that's right. I uh, try to do riparian grazing principles. And you can see that's, uh, I'll graze through there, um, you know, maybe twice a year. And uh, that, that's a, that stream will dry up in the summertime uh, and isn't the, isn't the source of water except when the cattle are in there. And that water actually stays pretty cool. This is an example. Um, um, every once in a while, I'll get caught. I'll put cattle out a bit too early and get some nasty weather. And you can see that's, really not a, that's probably early April. We went, th went through a you know, nasty spell. And yeah, there is some uh, damage to the, to the uh, riverbank here. This is an intermittent stream, by the way. This is not a permanent stream. It'll dry up in, in, you know, in July and August. Uh, nevertheless, there is some damage there. But that's, that's not a good picture, but that's the same, that's the same shot taken uh, either that fall or the, or the next spring. And I think you can see there's, you know, there's a, quite a bit of healing that's taken place in a relatively short time. Uh, this is a section of the um, Beatty Sogging River, and uh, I will never graze that section. I, I think that's the way that should be, and it's, it's going to stay that way. I think there's sections of, the, of, of rivers in, in Ontario anyway that really shouldn't be grazed. And I think that's one of them. So <clears throat> that's really the end of my sort of main talk. I thought I have a few more minutes, so I thought I'd do a just focus on a couple of other little interesting things that I, that I do and, and share my philosophy with what I, what I do. I'm not saying anyone else should do this. I'm just saying this is the way I approach it. So I really like starting light sales barn cattle. They're, they're high risk. Um, they're interesting to start with, and they're, they're a high reward. And, and I'm a veterinarian, so it sort of goes hand in hand. So my idea is to get these uh, I don't do as much as I used to, but I would get these sort of high-risk, you know, skinny, scrawny, deprived cattle, and the goal is to turn them into that. And usually I was able to do that. And so there's a whole pattern of things to do to get the cattle from one end to the other, but the critical time is on, is on arrival. And so there's basically there's processing, paddock training, water, food, and shelter. Um, so processing is very simple. You know, I just use a five-way uh, vaccine. I'd use an, a long-acting antibiotic, individual body weight, and if they haven't been dewormed, they'll deworm them. Uh, water, again, is critical. 
Uh, I have very few health problems over the years. And if I do run into some problems, it's usually because I made a mistake with, with something with the water. And uh, I mean, here's an example here. There's an old style water bowl, which is not good for these calves. You put a, a, a trough in that they can reach. It's overflowing. You can see how it's running out there. They find the water right away. Feeding is the same thing. You know, yes, you, well, you want to feed good hay, but it's also the way it's presented. So basically, I'll just go and I'll make sure there's lots of space for these calves to eat. And uh, if they don't want it, they can, they can, throw it. They can just pick through it. A bedding area, this is, this is a, again, this is probably uh, early April. And this is, I'm starting ca calves in, in, a, in a yard in this situation. And I have an outside bedding pack. There's a barn behind there. I keep them out of the barn as much as possible. This is more, more labor intensive. And there's more work involved. There's manure to clean up and so on. So I, I don't prefer to use this, but it just happens that I have to use some of these barns sometimes. What I prefer to do is start the calves out in these gladed, these gladed grazing areas. And so this is, again, about the same time of year. And the only reason I have this here is there's a, there's a stream right through there. And so these calves can find the water. And so the, the water source is natural. They can, often they can find a lot easier than they can find a water trough. I'll use bale grazing principles. So basically I'll just stockpile some, some bales of hay in these gladed paddocks electric fence around it, and then just uh, roll the bales out. Let, let them eat hay on the ground. You can see there's a grain feeder in the back. That's part of it as well. That's just uh, another, uh, just an example of what you think you're spoiling the, the, the paddock by putting hay out. Just the opposite. It makes it better. As we've heard all day today that, haven't we? Uh, I, to, to save labor and re reduce costs, I'll, I'll just feed hay, and I'll have these uh, these pellet, these grain, these self feeder, these self grain feeders, and I'll put in a low to medium protein uh, pellet in there, just so I'm going to give them a little bit more dry matter intake. So again, in the spring it does rain sometimes. You know that you think that place gets all chewed up. You think you've destroyed it. Actually, again, that's the same picture. It actually makes it better. You know, there's organic matter in there. You know, soil compaction is something I hear all the time from uh, cash croppers and so on. I really don't think I've seen any problems with soil compaction at all. I can get a, 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 these cattle can turn a field into mud. And you know what? Next year it comes back better than ever. Another picture of some cattle going out to uh, early grazing. Uh, you know, this uh, this has a, this is an, again this is an ideal starting starting paddock. There's lots of shelter. That's on the west side. It's a, it's a shelter from the west winds. In front here, there's an intermittent stream that's flowing in the spring. You know, these calves are going out. You can tell they've just gone out. They're just a little bit stressed yet. They don't know what's going on. Uh, you know, basically everything's in, in place for them. All I do is put a grain feeder up on top of the hill there. And uh, there they are in that. That is that corner right there. So when the weather turns bad, they go, they go in that corner. Uh, you know, I just put one of those grain feeders in front there, put a bale of hay. You know where the water is. Everything's fine. This is a, a, another picture of another farm. And every once in a while, I just jump the gun a little bit. And I learn my lesson. So this was taken about three or four years ago. And uh, this was uh, middle of March. I was starting to graze in the middle of March. And uh, this time, it, it came back to bite me because this, they're doing great right here. About a week later, we got a late season uh, April snowstorm blizzard. And those cattle were huddled up on that corner right there for about a week and a half. And I had a heck of a time keeping them going. Luckily, I was able to find a neighbor who had exceptionally good hay. And by feeding good hay and just giving them a bit of a corner there, they, they were able to get through it. Uh, but basically, it was the wrong place. Those cattle are, were not adjusted to it. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the cattle I used to get came out of the province of Quebec. These calves were often housed inside their whole, the whole winter. So when you put these calves out, they would actually just panic. And part of your job, my job as a manager, was not to look for sick cattle, but to help these calves find an appropriate place, help make sure that they got around the, 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 the grazing cell, found the water, found the feed, found the appropriate shelter. And then these calves here didn't find the appropriate shelter. They went to the wrong spot, and I really had a heck of a time with them. 
Um, not very many losses, but just, just a lot of work, that's all. Uh, Cow-calf management. Um, I also run a small cow-calf operation. And um, it's a, it's, I think it's a, the way I look at it, it's a shared responsibility between myself and my cows. So <clears throat> my job is to um, find the right kind of cows that, that can look after themselves, find appropriate bulls that help them calve easily, feed them properly, and give them a good calving environment. That's my job. As far as I'm concerned, their job is to raise me a calf unassisted without any help in the fall. And, uh, you know, if I don't do my job right, then I, get, I better get better. And if, they don't, if she doesn't do her job right, she only gets one chance at it. So this is a picture taken a while ago with my kids. And this is probably the most worthless piece of, of, of land to a cash cropper in, in, in uh, Bruce County. This is actually the most valuable piece of land I have as far as my, my calving operation. It's a, it's a gravel-based uh, hill with lots of trees in it. There's a fence that's all around, and there's mature trees all around. There's sloughs all the way th all through this, this section here, and there's a stream in the front. So uh, there's the cows April 25th of this year going to that, that calving area. There they are calving on May 5th. There's the cow-calf pairs in that section. It's just a tremendous place. I feed them on the ground. Again, there's a picture of what, what the uh, aftermath looks like. And then uh, sometime in May, I move the calves out and start rotating through the, through the grazing sections. There's, there they are in May and July, September, September. And then I have a different idea of weaning. Um, so what I decided to do is, um, I built these, I modified these, these steel gates, made them, made them so the calves would go, go through, and I start pre-feeding them in either in, the, in this place, in the, in, a, in the barn area. I have, my other farm, I had a different, different setup. It was more of a, a corral, but the same principle. Basically, the calves went in there and started uh, creep-feeding. So when it came time to wean, all I did is I just took this, this gate out, put the uh, feeder outside, put the whole herd in the barn, and then put the gate back up, let the calves filter out. So the calves would filter out, the cows were in the barn, I loaded the cows up and took them to another, other locations, uh, and then they grazed cover crops. So that's the, cow, the wean cows on October 8, um, putting some condition on for the winter season. And there's the calves, I leave the calves behind, so they stay behind for a month, month and a half, and uh, uh, took them a day to figure out their mothers were gone. That's not quite true. Took them half a day to figure their mothers were gone. And uh, uh, there was no stress because they were, they were on the, the creep feed already. They knew where the water was, and they knew exactly where every field was. So basically, they, I just rotated the, cow, the calves through the same rotation they've been through all summer. And there's a picture of these calves uh, on October 25th before weaning. Uh, the only thing is you can't sell them because... Uh, these calves, they turn from calves into yearlings, and you can't sell an animal like that as a, as a calf. So as it turns out, I just keep them myself anyway. I'll winter them, I'll winter them through, and I'll probably sell them this spring. Um, <clears throat> so opportunities and challenges. You know, it sounds as though everything's going really great. There's a lot of things they're doing that, that, that aren't going well, but I still haven't hit that high water mark that I had in 2012. And so... There are, I have to try to identify limits to performance. And I'm wondering if in my location there aren't some things going on that I haven't learned how to manage it or adapt to yet. Uh, I'm wondering, um, fescue, toxicity, ergot is, is a problem in the rest of North America. I have identified ergot bodies on uh, my mature seed grasses. I wonder if that's not part of the problem. Could very well be I'm not intensively grazing enough. Maybe mob grazing might help or clipping. Phytohormones, uh, you know, we, so there's quite a, quite a bit of clovers in, in, uh, in my grass, and uh, uh, sometimes I get ex excess riding act activity, and I wonder if that's part of it. Uh, water quality is always an issue. 
I'm always concerned about water quality. I test the water, and I'm just wondering if there's something's going with some of these water areas. Um, I'm also, uh, as you can tell, I'm extending the grazing season, uh, trying to use uh, cover crop, cover crops, and and uh, crop re residues, and that's actually helped quite a bit. Uh, the last three or four years, I'm actually switching away from just a straight grazing operation to an integrated operation. And, uh, you know, basically, how do we maintain soil structure, minimize erosion, prevent nutrient loss? You know, so I think cover crops and grazing residues is a great way to maintain soil health. Um, uh, I'm going away from the traditional practices. I, I do everything is done by custom work. So I'm trying to work with custom operators to to go to basically no-till or minimal-till systems and, uh, and cover crops. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is try to add extra nutrients through pasture years, put money, put fertility into the bank, and then take something out of the bank when I'm, when I'm cropping uh, these, these farms. Uh, just something I did just this past year, I seeded oats and rye on, uh, on soybeans. Uh, September 16th, those beans came off. This year we had a tough year, anyone in Bruce County knows. Those beans came off the first week of December. So if I had to wait till then to do anything, I wouldn't have got even winter wheat in the ground. Uh, actually worked quite well. That's a picture of us loading up that plane. It was really slick. We got 200 acres done in about two and a half hours. Uh, there is the cereal rind on December 12th of this year before the snow came. I'm not sure if that's a very good picture, but you can see that hint of green through there. There is rye coming through there. That's just the, the, um, uh, the soybean straw. But there's, there's a pretty good catch of rye through there, I think, anyway. And I took this picture uh, last week. Again, I'm not, not sure if it shows up, but you can see that rye is already starting to come through and starting to grow and starting to you know, collect solar energy and, uh, and do all those good things that we talk about and we all hear about. So I'm actually was planning on, I, I'm just talking to Jack Kyle. I just might see if I can graze this, graze this, uh, this section rather than just spraying it and putting it back into something.